In this video, you're going to meet the Amazon seller who's now making $1.5 million a month. He has an Amazon business and also teaches people how to be successful and create a part of full-time income on Amazon. So I'm here with my good friend, Bashar from the Miamis. How are you doing, man? Good, man. How about you? Thank you very much for having me. I'm doing great, dude. So the first thing I want to start off with is your story of really how you got into Amazon in the first place. So you can really start off from the beginning yeah. and essentially kind of what led you to Amazon. I know there's restaurant history in there, but... Let's talk about it. I know I know your story a little bit, but let's talk about it for the people listening who don't know. Sure. So um, I think it all started way back uh, when I was probably five, six years old, watching my dad, uh, you know, uh, being an entrepreneur and just crushing it in the entrepreneurship uh, space. And that's when I wanted to really, um, he was my first, uh, he was the first person that I admired to be, you know, he was the, the first person that I wanted to really become like. And uh, this is kind of when it, where it all started. Um, I had an opportunity to start my own business uh, in 2003, and that's where uh, the, you know, kind of I branched out of uh, 2013. That's where I branched out of the, the family business and did my own thing. Three years into, well, six months into it, I realized that I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Uh, the restaurant was failing. Uh, you know, we were losing a lot more money than we were making, and... Um, that's when I discovered uh, a, a concept of KISS, keep it simple, stupid. But uh, at the time, it was a little too late uh, because about two months after implementing that concept, which actually helped my business tremendously, the restaurant caught on fire. I had no insurance um, and lost lost about half a million bucks in the process, came out of it with 150K in debt. And that's when I decided to kind of take a different path than just retail because I had only done restaurants and retail, never yeah. done anything online. A friend of mine suggested to, you know, to look into how to make money online. And that's where I kind of, uh, you know, it was my first interaction with anything that I had to do online, which was about 2015, late 2015. Right. So, so a few questions to break this down. So first of all, and this is a personal question, but I'm just, I'm curious. I've seen a pattern, especially along, uh, really successful men and i mean i mean you're you, you know you're doing tremendous your team's tremendous with the impact you've had is amazing and uh you've absolutely crushed it and so i consider you one of these successful people and i want to know if your dad was successful and you wanted to be the entrepreneur your dad was was yeah. there ever like a thing where you were prove like wanting to prove yourself to your dad in some way like i know Herbozy talks about for instance mm. uh one of the biggest things was proving his dad wrong right and his dad wanted to go to one path he wanted to prove his dad wrong there's a lot of other guys who, uh, you know, even billionaire level success, a lot of it is about proving something to their dad. So I'm just curious if that was there all for you or, because um, I don't know, I mean, obviously it takes a huge drive to get a 10 plus million a year, so. Yeah, so um, it wasn't, um, it was actually the opposite because I, in 91, uh, when the Gulf War um, on Iraq happened, my dad's business is all collapsed and what happened was that on the outside we looked wealthy because my dad had accumulated all this like properties and stuff like that but as he didn't have a cash flowing business so for the first like 10 15 years of my life we lived hand to mouth but he always to me was that person that i wanted to be like he was very respected in the community people really came up you know came to him for advice uh people looked up to him um and it was a driver instead of like the driver was being like him, not proving him wrong. You know what I mean? And yeah. then after when, as I mentioned, as as my his business has collapsed and like he couldn't support us, what I wanted to do is I wanted to be in the situation where I could support him when I grew, when he, you know, when he grew older. I wanted to be there for him, just like he was there for me when I was younger. Right. Okay. Makes perfect sense. Now you got into the restaurant business. I just want to, talk about this for a second because a lot of people like I know when I was growing up grew up Midwest and you know entrepreneurship to us was you know oh we're gonna start a bar start a restaurant like look at all these places making all this money right and like I've only heard from restaurant entrepreneurs it's probably like the worst business you can get into so I'm just curious what your thoughts are about the restaurant business the pros the cons and just your overall thoughts on it so you know I'm probably the wrong person to ask that question to and here is why it's kind of like, you know, someone takes your program or takes my program, they do something completely, you know, fucked up and then they don't succeed and then they call us cameras or they don't, you know, they call the, 
the thing right. like it doesn't work. So Stand, for me, yeah. I had a bad experience with restaurants and that had nothing to do with the fact that restaurants are a terrible business. I was a terrible operator. I didn't right. know how to lead people. I didn't know how to manage the restaurant. I didn't know how to make it work. But overall, so like I, I wouldn't say don't get into restaurants, but overall I would say that restaurants are definitely one of the toughest businesses because I had people that had ran successful restaurants and it's, you know, there was a saying in that industry where restaurants, you know, you're in business of counting pennies because your profit margin is like, you know, five, okay. seven, eight percent, you know, if you're lucky. Yeah. Uh, and so it is definitely a tougher business to start. And, and, and unlike what we do, I mean, you know, the restaurant we got into, we had to invest 200K up front to get it started. We invested another two, three hundred thousand dollars over the following couple of years. And so it, it needs a lot of um, upfront capital and a lot of time investment into it, you know? Yeah, I always feel like real estate where it's like, you know, there's a tremendous, like, cause I know some, there, I forget his name, but he's been on, um, he wrote a book. He's a billionaire. Uh, Greg Cardone inter interviewed him four or five years ago. And he built it through restaurants and hospitality. Sure. And I've also looked into investing. I didn't actually invest, but into a hedge fund that was purely hospitality and restaurants. And I feel like it's almost like real estate to where it's a great way to park capital because like you're taking out debt on the location. You can pay down the location or you can even pay down um, and build your equity in sure. the property if you own it. But it's got really, really thin margins. So similar to real estate where like your cash flow is like cash on cash, probably 8%. Your margin's not that good whatsoever. And if you buy wrong or you operate wrong, you're going to be in the red really quickly. I feel like it's kind of like the same way. So here is something that I remember from a conversation that I had with someone that ran nightclubs, because this is kind of like that first um, first phase of my life of like becoming an entrepreneur. I saw myself as just growing in the hospitality industry. I started the restaurants. I wanted to get into nightclubs and bars and and lounges and that kind of stuff, and then just kind of build from there. Right. I had a conversation one time with someone who actually was had a construction company that only built restaurants, and wow. he built some of the largest and most uh, uh, um, uh, luxurious restaurants and bars in San Diego County, which is where I lived. And he told me this. He said something about this industry. He said all these bars and clubs that you frequent or you know or whatever. It's like, usually the only person that makes money is the management or the owners. Because what they usually do is they go to people that have made millions of dollars in other places that, as you said, want to park their money somewhere. They bring them in as investors. They go open these lavish restaurants and spend all this crazy money on, on building five, six, seven million dollar restaurants and bring all these uh, uh, talented chefs. From day one, they lose money and they never make money. Five, six, seven years later, they shut down and they're the only people that actually end up making money. And I was like, huh, that's it. And one toxic industry. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's very similar to like the private equity, venture capital things where they're getting their management fees, they're getting the upsides on the winners, and then the investors hold the bag. Right. Um, do you think, so you probably think you could have made it successful. Knowing what you know now, and then we'll move on to the rest of your story, but knowing what you know now, because obviously... Uh, you have one of the best teams that I've seen uh, come through our stuff and your culture is great. Your team's great. Love everybody on your team. What, what things would you do differently now having built the business you've built to potentially make that more successful? Um, honestly, right before the restaurant failed, I actually had turned it around. Um, so we were for the two, three years that I owned it, we were averaging like twenty five, twenty seven thousand dollars $27,000 a month in revenue. And literally two months prior to the fire, w the the first month we kind of did a change. We went to forty two thousand, and then the third month we were projecting to do sixty seven thousand. So we had tripled our numbers in, in in a two month period. And it was, it was a few things, and it, it's very simple and and very, um, at least at that level, it wasn't like the all these like tactical things that I had to do. It was very simple, just being a a. Uh, a kid, you know, just being an underdeveloped kid, pretty much, you know, with a big ego. For me, it was, I knew all the answers. No one could tell me what to do. Right. Um, no one could coach me. And, and, and when I became coachable, when I actually was open to getting advice, I was actually able to, to turn things around. The second thing was, you know, focus, which is one of our top core values. 
you would walk into my restaurant and you would be confused as shit to what the hell we serve because we served it all. You wanted yeah. it, we served it, you know? Right. It's kind of like going to Cheesecake Factory where you're like turning around and like, holy shit, how, how do I even make a decision here? And um, and it was just focusing on like one thing, you know, one solid thing, whether if it's uh, Spanish cuisine or American cuisine or whatever it is, just really focusing on one thing and doing it right. And then the third thing was actually providing a good opportunity for, for our team. One of the reasons why we have an awesome team now because we put their interests before ours. Now, yes, the house needs to win. The house needs to make money. The company needs to flourish. But at the same time, I also think about how, like, is this person growing, not just financially, because I can argue with anyone that if you have personal growth and not so much financial growth, people would stick with you more than if you had the other way around. Uh -huh. If you had all the money they could make in your company, but they feel like shit, either they're selling a product that they don't believe in or your culture sucks or it's toxic, you'll probably see people leave, right? And so our culture was toxic. I mean, I didn't, I hated my employees. My employees hated me. I hated my customers. My customers hated me. Um, so I would say that those were kind of the basic things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, what was the catalyst uh, that helped you kind of under, like pivot that? to under even understand because those are basic business principles right 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 now you're like oh it's obvious right what was like the catalyst that you were like bam like i know that's like turn around at, almost in a month and then within three months was projecting really really well like uh, what, what was the catalyst to learn all those lessons that you hire a coach that you join a program what was it um backs against the wall i've got no more answers you know it was just like i don't know what the fuck to do anymore i've been trying for months and years and I thought I knew it all, but I knew nothing. And I uh, just finally came to the realization that, holy shit, this thing is about to go out of business and something needs to change. And I finally started listening. Um, and once that pivot happened in my mind, I realized that there is so much out there that I don't know and that I can learn and implement. Um, and so at the time, I, hadn't, I, I didn't even know what self-development was, to be honest with you, but it was a coach. It was a man named Keith Carnavalli, uh, who, was, who originally brokered the deal to for me to buy the restaurant. Um, he his family had ran successful restaurants, and he started kind of coaching me through. And um, and he was the 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 first person that uh, that um, presented the concept of Kiss into my life, and that was awesome. That's awesome, man. So speaking of back back against the wall, it burns down. How did you feel in that moment? And then what led you to Amazon? Obviously, you know, you, you already mentioned you Googled make money online. You kind of went down that path. <laughs> Walk through that. So as I mentioned earlier, it was literally two months before the restaurant burned down that I had actually turned it around. Right. And so the fact that I had turned it around and then it burned down, I was like, well, what the fuck? You know, why, why didn't you happen six months ago? Why now? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I had borrowed all this money that I didn't have to like redo the name and redo the place and all that. It actually was going to work. Um, but it just wasn't meant to be, man. It's I believe that everything happens for a reason, because had that actually succeeded in a way, I would have probably still been doing that. I don't know what my life would have been like. You know, we we wouldn't have been friends. I wouldn't be here. Yeah. Um, so I do believe that everything happens for a reason. But um, April uh, uh, 28th, 2015, restaurant burns down, and uh, I was 25 years old, and I thought, fuck, that's it. My life is over. Um, you know, I, I've got nothing. I'm in debt. Everyone and their sister sues me. Uh, you know, I've got literally, I walk into my desk, and there's like lawsuits just everywhere. I mean, even the freaking cable network was suing me. Oh, my um, God. And it was just like probably like seven or eight lawsuits and I'm like being dragged into courts and it's like, and then the funny thing, I would get sued. So they would sue the corporation, but you as an owner cannot represent your corporation. You actually need to hire an attorney to represent your corporation. And I would literally walk in and the judge would be like, where's your attorney? I'm like, I can't afford one. You take it or leave it. If you want me to represent myself, I will. If not, I'm walking out. You can do whatever the fuck you want. I've got a business that shut down. I don't know what the hell do you want, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, and then it was at that moment, you know, it took me getting a DUI, started drinking heavily, got a DUI, got my license suspended. And uh, it was a friend, man, friend that I hadn't seen since high school. Um, he said, I asked him, I was like, what are you doing? He's like, I work from home. 
And I was like, what the fuck does that mean? What do you mean you work from home? How do you do that? Yeah. And, um, and this was the pivotal moment into going online and realizing that there's a whole nother world that I know nothing about. Yeah. And so how did you find Amazon from trying to go online after the friend kind of told you about it? So it was honestly just searching, man. It was just going online, searching, uh, going into what I call now the discovery phase of just searching anything and everything. And I started doing crypto. I started doing uh, penny stock trading. I started doing just kind of anything that I found. And that's when I came about the whole mentoring and self-development stuff. Right. I started watching people like Grant Cardone, Gary Vee, Tony Robbins, and um, started picking up books. And I just realized that there was a whole nother world that I knew nothing about. And then Amazon just kind of stuck to me. And you know, funny story, I, um, I was talking to one of our team the other day. Since I was a little kid, my favorite color has been orange. And I'm like, well, fuck, maybe that's why I got drawn to, to Amazon. You know, it's the colors. It, you know, my favorite color is orange. Amazon is orange. I don't know. But it yeah. was just that, you know, and a bunch of other things that I, it just, I got sucked into it. I started selling a toy in, uh, in Christmas of 2015 that I could buy from Home Goods for, I don't know, I think it was like $15, $16, and I flip it on Amazon for like 42 bucks. And I remember the first time I woke up and saw a forty two ninety nine sale on my phone, I went crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that was insane to me. The fact that I needed to buy the food, prep the food, serve the food, clean up the customer to make a sale, and now I literally I could make money in my sleep, that was bizarre to me, and I just got hooked ever since. Yeah, so explain for people who don't know what the Amazon kind of business model is for sellers. And, and the opportunity, essentially. I started doing retail arbitrage, and that's, I think, the simplest, easiest thing that you could do to start. Um, and the the way that you do that is um, you'd pretty much start a, um, you'd go to, to the stores, clearance section, scan things, see how much they, they're selling for, how much they're selling for at the store, how much they're selling for on Amazon. I made sure there was at least a $10 gap in between um, after shipping and fees and all that stuff. I would buy them there, I would ship them to Amazon, do FBA, and then sell them. And that was great to start. I didn't need a whole lot of money. The problem was there is limited inventory, and um, you have to be driving around all day, because that's all I did, literally all day, while driving for Uber and while working uh, 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 as a dishwasher. Right. Um, and that's when I realized that they're like, this is cool, but in order for me to scale it to thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars, I needed something more scalable. And that's when I found out about Alibaba and the whole concept of private label. Interesting. Okay, great. So what were you selling when you were doing the arbitrage in the beginning? And then how did you, and then like when you pivoted to Alibaba, what did that look like? So I start with arbitrage. I would just go in and scan a bunch of things. The one thing that hit for me, it was around Christmas. There was a doll. I can't remember the brand, but it was a doll. They came in pink and purple. I would buy those and I would sell them on Amazon. It was like a like a, a like it was a branded item. I even tried to like recreate it, but then I was told that I could get sued and, and get shut down because I would be pretty much yeah. fringing upon the the brand, right? Yeah. And that's when I was like, all right, but how can I do this legally? And that's when I found out about private label because with private label, you know, say this is a can of water, I can go to the manufacturer and get this can same can of water and put my own brand on it and then sell it on Amazon, right? And that's when I realized that I could do that and I started building my own brands. Right. So, well, so you 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 started with the the Christmas thing and then when you went to private label, what were you selling then? Um, the first three products that flopped. Uh, anyone watching, don't don't do the don't do these uh, because those flopped seven years ago. I'm pretty sure they'll flop today. Uh, the first thing was a, a thing called Molecular Model Kit. It's this little Adams and Bonds kit that kids use in school. Um, that flopped because it was seasonal. The second product was uh, a Nerf kit, N Nerf gun kit, or something like that. It's like for Nerf guns, it comes with like darts and, you know, I did a whole thing with it. It was like, uh, like goggles and a vest and all that stuff. And that was not differentiated correctly, so that failed. And then the third failed product was a, um, um, what was it? It was a uh, silicone, uh, silicone straw. So it was a combination of silicone, bamboo, and uh, stainless steel straws that I created a bundle of. 
and I tried to sell them on Amazon, and that failed because it, the, the 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 niche was just too competitive. Yeah. So after those flopping, I realized that okay, someone else is doing it successfully, and that's when I got into education and buying courses, and I just got hooked after that. Oh, I see. Okay, so then you got some help, you got some education. Then what was like the breakthrough point where you started like actually crushing it? And it was very easy, man. I and and this is the ego thing again. Because I knew about courses before I started my private label thing. Because yeah. I mean, now I was on YouTube. I started seeing all these, you know, guys running around in Lamborghinis and stuff like that. And, and I remember in particular, there was a 17, 18 year old kid that had a white Lamborghini. I was 25 years old and he was 17 and he was crushing it. And I wow. was not. And I was like, what the fuck? He could do it. I could do it. I'm not paying this guy 500 bucks for his course. After I lost seven thousand dollars in three products, I'm like, I'm paying him five hundred dollars for his course. Yeah. So then I went and bought it, sat at Starbucks, banged out the whole course in like eight nine hours. It was the worst course I've seen put together on planet Earth, but it gave me two three things that I was like, oh shit, if I knew these, I wouldn't have failed, you know. Right. And then from there, uh, you know, launched um, launched a um, what was the first product after? The first product after was a little, uh, this little, right now it's very competitive, but back then it wasn't. This little glove, this, um, what is it called? Like a little glove that you use to, to get hair off of your pet or whatever. It's like this blue glove. Right, I got you. whatever. Yeah. So this was the very first product that I sold. It didn't last very long because it got very competitive quickly, but I actually found success and I was like, okay, I could do this. And then from there, I just started launching products and I've launched over 130 products since then. Nice, nice. So at your peak, how was your Amazon business looking like? Did you have staff? I didn't know how these things work. So it's like, do you have staff or were you just doing it all yourself, private labeling? Um, like what type of revenue were you doing? Um, what did that look like as you started to hit traction? So 2018 was the first year. 2017 was the first year that I did a million dollars in my life ever as a, you know, just as an entrepreneur. Right. And at the time, I probably, so I did about, I think, 1.2, 1.4, something like that. And I had, I want to say, two VAs, and they, they were in, in Pakistan. All they were doing is negotiating with suppliers, right. making sure my listings are, you know, are doing performing, uh, managing my PPC campaigns, um, just kind of running the day-to-day -day while I kept high level, you know? Uh -huh. um, so this was the first year, the first seven-figure year. 2018, I did probably about two and a half million, uh, two and a half, three million. And then from there, it just kept on scaling. Now we do about half a million a month or so. Nice. Still on Amazon. Yep. Got it. Yeah. So I'm invested in, so right now I'm not an active Amazon seller, but I'm an investor. As of about a year and a half ago, I pulled back from actively selling and I invested in other uh, businesses, which are our coaches' businesses. Oh. So we have three of my businesses are belong to our coaches in our, in our university and combined they do about half a million a month oh that's awesome so you kind of almost have used like your coaching now is almost like the uh way to get the the businesses in the door to be able to it's almost like kind of like private equity in a, in, a, in a sense to where you, i didn't even know you did that so you can invest into these amazon businesses and essentially like you kind of can pick the winners and the best ones to help them scale further and that's kind of uh what we want to focus on as well uh, a little bit next year is create a fund that yeah. will invest in our students' businesses, take a stake, charge them for for interest, but also take a stake in their business and help them grow. Because one of the biggest challenge that physical product businesses face is funding. You know, especially if you're a new entrepreneur, don't have any, you know, don't have business credit, don't have any of that. It's difficult for you to raise funds. Yeah. So then, how did you get into? Okay, what was the catalyst for you to start teaching people what you were doing and having success with? Um. So this was late 2018, early 2019, um, because I had kind of like stepped away from the world for like two, three years to figure out this thing. And once I kind of came back out, a uh, few friends started wondering what I was doing. So I started helping a couple of guys to get online. Some I charged money for, some I didn't, just kind of helping them out. Uh, one of them in particular, um, I was charging like $75 an hour or something, just like getting on Zoom calls and just kind of helping people like show people yeah, around yeah. and all that. Um, one of them in particular probably had the most success at the time. I got a text message one day saying, Bashar, you're the fucking man. In the last six months, I've made 36 grand in profits. 
I was like, holy fuck, wow. And it's yeah. like, but most importantly, what I love about it is I'm now able to travel around the country because all he did, he was a, a kid from North Carolina. All he wanted to do is go into, I don't even know what they're called, but he used to uh, get into like their bikes and there was like tournaments and stuff like that. Uh -huh. So that's all he wanted to do. And before then, he would be like borrowing money from here and there and like need to get his job, you know, put a, a two week notice or whatever for his job so that way he could travel. And now he was able to do that um, without needing to worry about money or, you know, a job or whatever because he could run his business from anywhere. Um, and that felt good, man. It felt really good to be able to like do something for someone else, you know, because until now it was about me helping me and me figuring out my money problems and me, you know, trying to solve my issues. But I'm pretty sure you know, uh, yeah. and I'm not sure the reason why you got into coaching, but I'm pretty sure it's similar. To a certain point, you get, you get numb to, 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 to money being the driver, right? And then it's like, well, what's the bigger purpose in life? You know, I've got money coming in. I've bought a nice car. I, you know, I live in a nice place. I, I have money in the bank. Well, you know, what's next? I can invest in things. That's great. But it's like, what's next for me? You know, what's the next step? And for me, that helping someone else make that change in their life really felt good. And I just pressed on that, you know, and, and since then it's become my mission. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, very, very similar to me, you know, obviously instead of Amazon for me, it was sales, right? right. And so it was high ticket sales. I was making like $30,000 a month take home as a sales rep, which is really, really great. Was really burned out, was taking calls all day, every day. And then found myself uh, leaving the company I was at, which at the time was a top company in the industry. So I didn't really have like a next, like before I was like a sales rep for an okay company. Then I went to a better one. Then my third one, I was like at the best. So I was kind of at this place of like, I don't know where else to go. You know, like there's no, like even Alex Ramosi's uh, guys at the time, they weren't making the money I was making. So I was like, man, what do I do? And I went to a mastermind in San Diego and I started helping somebody with sales in like a, it was like one of those classic like, 15 people sitting in a circle and each person has like a problem, right? And I just was able to solve all these people's problems because I knew the business model pretty well, but I also, you know, anything sales related or sales team related, I was just a ninja at that point. And I remember somebody taking me aside and being like, man, you should really just like launch a coaching program. Like you're, you're amazingly good at this. And that's what I did, you know? And, and obviously, like you said, it, it's amazing how much uh, more fulfillment I got from that especially when you can see the impact you have on people's lives, their income, et cetera, either getting into sales or, you know, I really started helping existing high ticket sales people get better. So your business now, explain kind of at a high level how it works for people who don't know what it is, BJ BJKU. So BJKU is a platform essentially that teaches people skills they can turn into income within 90 days or less. Um, we, you know, we're... Our, our competition is uh, traditional education. Right. Uh, that's our, our macro uh, competition. And so we're trying to provide people with a, with a with another way. Because, you know, we, we both believe that uh, that people will always seek better lives. And they want, you know, more of whatever it is. And usually in order for you to accomplish more, you need to, to up your skill level and whatever it is that you're doing. And so until now, traditional education colleges have had a monopoly on that, right? You go to school, you go to two-year, four-year, six-year, whatever it is. You spend 10, 20, 50, 100K per year, get a degree, and then hopefully someone hires you for 50, 100, 150K a year. And we're trying to change that, right? This, I think this whole industry is trying to change that. But our main focus is we're going to provide people with a skill. So today, the skill is Amazon just because I was an Amazon seller and I right. started teaching it, right? But in the future, over the next five to 10 years, we, our plan is to branch into other skills, providing people with okay. other skills that they can use to turn into income. This could be trading, Airbnb, this could be, you know, anything. This could be a skill that we have already, that we have, you know, acquired or that we have, I guess, accumulated because of our work. Or it could be a skill that we go out and acquire, you know, by buying someone else, by bringing in a micro-influencer under the umbrella of BJK University. And so essentially high level, that's pretty much what we are and what we're trying to do. So let's walk through all the parts of your business. First of all, and I, I know the answer to this, obviously, because you helped me a lot with this, but how do you get customers for uh, BJKU? 
Uh, so our main strategy is Instagram influencer marketing, and that's where we uh, use um, you know existing Instagram pages, motivational pages, to shout us out. We take best performing content on our own page, we send it to them, they drive traffic to our page, and through our content, we convert them into customers. Right. So just to put it in perspective too, I've seen a lot of people. So, so when I ran into Bashar and first and first uh, found out about him. I had heard about this Instagram thing he was doing. And I also had heard at this point that he was doing uh, over a million a month. And it was interesting because I had heard about the Instagram thing before, but I had ne- I, you know, I thought it was this thing that could maybe help you get off the ground. They're like, get to 100, 200 grand a month if you're lucky. But like, you would never build an eight figure business off shout outs. Yeah. You know, I just thought it was all, you know, it was okay way to get started, but like paid ads is really the way. And, uh, you were the first person I ever saw really scale it and then do it extremely profitably. And obviously now, I, I don't know what our exact revenue per month is off shoutouts. We, we kind of vary it depend on, depending on the month. If YouTube's been doing better, we spend more on YouTube ads. If uh, shoutouts is doing better, we spend more on that. But I would say we make at least five to 700 grand a month and we've been doing that all year just off shoutouts. And that's really running your system, you know? So what do you think made you so much better on Instagram and more effective than how most people were doing it? Um, I think it was just extreme focus and and really going all in to figuring it out because I had done, like for me personally, um, trying to, 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 to pick up the, the, the consulting business off the ground, I learned everything that I know about consulting from Sam Ovens, right? And now we're right. learning from people like herself and others in the industry, but with Sam Ovens, like I started with with organic, you know, reaching out to people, getting them in the DMs, and then getting them on the phone. But that only could scale to thirty, forty, fifty grand a month. And I was like, dude, I'm working eighteen hours a day, and I still have a multi seven figure Amazon business that I need to run. And I was like, Breath. I started this because it, I felt like it was my passion, but now it's becoming a burden than anything, you know, right. it's burning yep. the shit out of me. And so I figured out the whole paid ad stuff. And I started on Facebook, and I scaled that to about one hundred fifty k a month until I woke up one day and there was nothing. You know, Facebook yeah. decided to shut it down. And for like two months after I tried it, you know, it was one day it was the user got shut down, ad account, business manager, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, fuck this. I'm not doing this anymore. I hired an agency to help me with YouTube ads because I didn't want to learn it. And they just couldn't get us profitable. It was break even. And then I went and got Alex Becker's course. And I'm like, I fired him. I'm like, I'm going to learn YouTube ads and I'm going to figure this thing out. And literally the last like day or two before I fired them, my account manager was like, hey, bro, I've heard of Instagram shout outs. And I'm like, what the fuck is that? He's like, well, yeah. here's a couple examples. There's this guy doing like 20, uh, like how much is it? Like 50 grand a month or something like that off of this thing. And it's like, he spends like five grand a month. And I'm like, he spends five grand and makes 50? Holy shit. Yeah. And so I, as I was learning YouTube ads and trying to figure that out on my own, I also started trying to do this Instagram thing. And then I found a couple of guys who were willing to go all in with me. And I was like, all right, let's do it. So they took that over. And then from there, it just like literally month after month, it started like proving itself. And then we just started dumping more money on it. And so it was a couple of things was just extreme focus and willing to like really test something new that literally has first zero tracking until now. We still don't know. Like, if you know, like we got to guess. But we still don't know if this page is good, that page is bad, or whatever. We're always making guesstimates. Um, unlike ads, where you know, to the ad, to the click, to the every single thing, you know what's going on. And so the willingness of like saying, fuck it, I'm going all in, although I don't have all the information, as long as I'm profitable, keep scaling. Yeah. So, and then basically, to, to summarize this for, for people who are wondering, and, and you should check out Bashar's page, it's, it's really, really good. Uh, they drive traffic from the influencers. It sits on his page for a little bit. They have also have another page and then it goes to a short via cell phone where they book a call or they get on the email list and they book a call and join the wait list. And eventually they're in your program. Now, once you're in their pro or once they're in your program, what is sort of like the steps that you help these folks through? Like we call them activation points in the sense of it's like for us, like if it's somebody who's a beginner and wants to get into remote sales, the first thing we do is we onboard them. Then we get them on the coaching calls. Then after that, the next activation point is we download all the skills 
from the training into them while they're going through the modules and we make them do a certain role play requirements so they actually get like in the field training before they're going to go out there and try to get a position then the next activation point is them landing their first interview then after that it's them getting their first getting hired and then after that it's making their first sale so for you what is kind of the the pathway look for the students who would be interested in joining yeah so the very first thing would be after the sale is after the enrollment is the onboarding. So that's the I guess in your words is the first activation uh, point. Right. And yeah. that usually is a um, is a group uh, onboarding call where we take them through a specific um, uh, kind of a, a specific um, not agenda just a specific uh, sequence of what we need them to do and kind of next steps. The next thing would be going through the program and then start product research. And for us, for Amazon, that's the biggest thing. It's finding that product. And usually a lot of people get overwhelmed with product research because again, that is the biggest, like the biggest needle mover because you could literally spend 20 hours and not find a product where sometimes you'll spend literally five minutes and find an incredible product, right? Right. So the next point would be finding that product, getting it analyzed by our coaches. And then from there, uh, um, ordering their first sample. So once they order their first sample, make sure the quality is good, then it would be uh, um, placing their order. And then after, right after that would be, you know, making their first sale pretty much or launching their product. Um, after you've launched your product, the next, kind of the next jump, it would be making your first 10K a month. And this is where now we're building a, like all of, and, and I think this was kind of the conversation that we had last, the first time we met, um, it was, we were focused on one thing. And I think I took this whole focus thing to like a complete extreme, you know, yeah. because we were focused on one traffic source, one funnel, one product, one sales process, one everything, you know? And then now we realize that we need to be meet people where they're at, you know? So right, right now we have our program, which is our main coaching program, but we have built an eight or a six program kind of uh, vertical that takes people from a complete beginner to entrepreneurship, not even to Amazon. Like a right. complete someone that just need that just needs their mindset really shifted all the way to uh to where they're a uh, 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 a seven figure Amazon seller. And then we want to take that same model and apply it in other verticals. So that's kind of the the mission for next year. Yeah. It's launching all those programs. We have the first program launching in January, which is the current program takes people from zero to ten K a month. The next program would take them from 10 to 30 or 50K a month. And then from there would be a mastermind that takes them from 30, 50 to about 100K a month. Right. Well, you know what's super interesting is like, I actually wrote about this and it was either a YouTube video I was doing recently or I was doing some sort of content. I wrote about this, but it's like we got from zero to uh, about $30 million a year pace. And for us, we did that off two offers, right? We had the, well, well, two, you know, we had the B2C company and the B2B company, but both had two offers, front end high ticket, back end high ticket. And you know how you read in Russell Brunson's uh, book, Expert Secrets, how you're supposed to build the ascension ladder. And like when I was brought into this space, you know, I was always of the mind of like, well, that's a scam, like that's stupid. Like it's a bad, you know, you shouldn't start your business that way, which I agree with that it's a bad way to start your business. But I do believe for guys like us to get from 10 million to 100 million plus, you have to build out that full product suite. Yes. And that was one of the things that we did that really helped us three, four, five months ago is we launched a 997 auto webinar product that sold, didn't need salespeople to sell, that could be the intro and we drove all our traffic now goes to that. Right. And so that plus the outbound setter thing we do is tremendous. So I think you're along the right lines with that. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And, and there's also, there is... Uh, in my mind, there is one step even below that, uh, where but that's more of a, like a super high volume, more broad, and it just kind of depends on what your longer term is. Because for us, that would be essentially the feeder into everything, and from there we would branch them into multiple verticals once we have multiple verticals, right? Because right. your your the the nine ninety seven course kind of DIY thing, it would be sending them into this one vertical, but this kind of right. lower step would ascend could potentially send them into other, it's kind of like the, it's like, um, it would be kind of similar to like Ty Lopez 67 or 60, whatever, yeah. or Snips or whatever thing it was, right? Yeah, and I know was, exactly. Yeah, it was all mindset, but zero like actual strategy, but it's kind of like, that's the foundation that you need. And then from there, yeah. they would get on 
this path of I go here, I go here, I go there. You know what I mean? Yeah. So what what's the price point of your entry one now going to be? Like the one uh, that's just mindset and stuff like that. So that would probably be a more of a subscription. So we're kind of um, still in the process of like thinking of what that would look like, and 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 that's like two products out. So that's like still Q3 of next year. Uh, but I'm thinking anywhere between twenty seven and forty seven dollars a month or so. Cool. Gotcha. So that's going to be the big plan to scale to 30 to 50 mil plus. Yeah. Our goal for next year is 40 million. Nice. What do you think is the biggest thing, you know, along with launching those new products, what are the things, the biggest things that you feel like are the bottlenecks right now from you getting to that level or even beyond that level? Our company needed systems. Uh, we lacked systems and processes. Um, and maybe it was different for you because you've worked at a company like that before. Yeah. And you you had seen how it needs to operate. Like I remember the first time we had a conversation, he said, I knew exactly how to get to a million dollars a month. I knew exactly yeah. what to do. I came in, boom, we got there in no time. Yeah. I have had never ran a company this size before or in this industry. The biggest company that I had ran prior to that yeah. was in the product and it was completely different. Way different. And it yeah. wasn't at this level, right? So- um, we kind of like we caught a a little traction, and then we scaled from literally in a twelve month period. We went from one hundred and fifty a month to two point three a month in less than a year, and so we skipped like two steps, two three yeah, steps. Yeah. I don't know how many steps there. Like in that, like I know that like Grant Cardone talks about this. I know a bunch of people talk about this. There's like these breaking points, you know? Right. We skipped yep. like two breaking points. And the biggest thing was, and we also overhired a bunch of people and then a whole bunch of stuff broke. And so literally all of 2022 was like, what did we fuck up? Where do we fix it? And for us, it all came back down to systems, systems and processes. So this yeah. was the biggest bottleneck that I feel like we're coming out on the other side now and we're actually starting to launch new things. Um, so, but that was the biggest bottleneck for us. Dude, one of the things I'd say that would really help you guys too is like if you, well, well, um, oh, by the way, before I even say that, to rewind one step, what he's talking about if, um, for people who are listening, is when we had that dinner, I, I had basically worked at Traffic and Funnels and I was their top sales rep um, along with uh, Taylor's brother, Peyton, who was the other top sales rep. It was just basically us and just us two carried the team to like a million three to a million five a month. And we were starting at like 300 grand a month when I came on. So that evolution going from 300 to a million five and doing it in an office, I had learned by, even though like my main thing was sales, and I learned a lot about sales and sales leadership and sales teams and outbound sales, which was my main skill set. The main thing that I really got from that that helped me so much later on is I just was a part of a company, literally in the company, in an office. And I just saw all how all the pieces worked, right? right? So I saw, okay, here's how the marketing team works. Oh, they, they, they meet after this time, right after the sales meeting. And then I would sit in on a marketing. Oh, okay, here's what they go over on the marketing meeting. And then I would learn, I, would, I was friends with all the, the people on the marketing team. And I was also friends with the controller. And, you know, I didn't even know what a controller was. So I think the first time I met this guy and he was like, I'm the controller. I was like, what is that? You know? And then, so then when I get to the point in the business where I need a controller, I'm like, oh, I need a, I forget his name, but let's say his name was Tom. I'm like, I need a Tom. Then I saw what their COO did. I saw how they ran their events. I saw how they ran their mastermind. So like, and then their fulfillment processes. I was really good friends with their client success director. So I just knew the model right from the beginning. And that was yeah. so key. That was just, I cannot explain how much that helped me because one thing about running a company, it's, it's almost like you could read a lot of books on sales, but are you going to get good at sales? No. Right. right. You could read a lot of, you can read traction, you can read scaling up, you can read all these books on building companies, but like until you've actually been a part of a big company, you don't really know it. You know, it, it's something you feel, not something you know. Does right. that make sense? Yep. And so that was one of the biggest, biggest things that helped me. And that's one of the things I, I tell people that we're recruiting is like, I told them that story and how much it helped me and how much it's going to help them set the foundation for whatever they do later on, whether it's maybe they're a part of a different company and they're building teams that are really on value, you know, whatever it is. Uh -huh. So that's something that's very huge. I think for you guys, one of the biggest things I'd focus on next year is, and I know, you know, this is one of the things that we're helping Aaron with is um, the setters, uh -huh. especially if you have all these low ticket offerings. If you have that, 
and you have a really solid, solid outbound team, it'll funnel so well to all your high ticket stuff on the back end. Yeah, that's the that's the first that's uh, his uh, his kind of uh, his project for Q1 is to get the yeah. setters because uh, right now we have setters in the DMs and and they're producing uh, calls at like twenty eight twenty nine dollars, which is pretty awesome and they convert really well. Um, but the volume, you know, with with having a, a, a and you know we get like almost a thousand. Well, not right now, but we get a, between five to seven hundred opt-ins a day from Instagram. And oh my so God! Yeah. Trying to call those, you know, uh, uh, that's that's the first thing, and, and obviously that's thanks to you and and all the preaching you've been doing. Yeah, I mean, I, I like scream this one from the rooftops, and yeah, I mean, if you just call the opt-ins, that alone will be cr will be a crusher for you because what we do is, and I don't know if I told you this, um, did I tell you about the, the nine nine? I, I know I told you about the nine nine seven one, but earlier on this, but really the reason we did that is not to be profitable. It's just to liquidate the spend so that we have more opt-ins. And the majority of revenue still call, it comes from the opt-ins who don't even buy the front-end product. And the front-end mm -hmm. product is a true, even though it's automated, the, we, we, we tag it with their IP somehow. I'm not sure how this works, but I know this is what we do. To where like, if they watch that and they don't buy it, they can never buy it again. So it truly is a one-time, like when I say, oh, it's a one-time offer, you're gonna buy it out, literally, you cannot buy it again. Like oh, yeah, yeah. if you go to the page, it'll redirect you to a page to book a call because it knows based on your IP. Damn. And so um, that is one thing too, when you're doing this, you can think about because that model dropped our cost per acquisition of our B2C from two grand to 20, 226 bucks. 126? 226. Well, wow. From two, from two grand though. Wow. Right? That's awesome. Yeah. And so, and we were able to reduce their client load from 340 clients in a single month to 170 clients in a month and um, make probably about double the profit. That's awesome. That as well. Yeah. So I, I think that's a simple path for you. And then I, I like the private equity thing you're doing too in the fund is like a no brainer. I mean, that, that's an easy one. And honestly, I, that's, that's for me and for the team first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because a lot of our sales reps are like, dude, we're making all this money. Where the fuck do I put it? You know? And, and, and the one thing that I started seeing them do is like get shiny eyes, like, Oh, crypto, Oh, this the stock, this thing. And I'm like, Oh, this is not good. You know, I need to yeah. kind of find a solution for that. And so I was like, they're sold into the product They're They're sold into people. They enroll, they support them, even though they're, they're closers. I'm like, what, how can I bring, you know, like, let's bring all of our money together. Let's really help our students. And the fund also, you know, gets a percentage into their business. Yeah. We help them scale and potentially exit as well and make, you know, make money on the way in and on the way out. Yeah. I mean, it's also aligns with the mission. 100%. You know, they're able to put their money in something they already believe in and also something they have an influence on. That's right. Cool. Where can people find you? I would say Instagram. Just search Bishar Jika too. Make sure that um, it's the one with the 2.7, 2.8 million because there's like 20 other Bishar Jika 2s yeah, on there. I know. Oh, oh my God. So yeah, don't 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 fall you, for that. You, you get verified yet? Dude, it's been almost two years. Instagram is yeah. such a bitch when it comes to that. I mean, we've, you know, we've been featured in articles and done all this press and we've probably submitted for verification like 20 different times. Yeah, I don't know what's up with them. Is what it is, man. Well, dude, thanks for coming on. Appreciate and you. I'll be in Miami soon, so we'll connect. Sounds like a plan, man. Appreciate you.